I wanted her dark past to be really gnarly. I wanted her to have made a decision that keeps her up at night. The fact that this is the end of Natasha's story, it made it feel all right to go in there and show some of these things that have happened to her from her past that affected her and affected who she was as a person and, and what she had regret about. And I wanted that to be actually pretty bad and a thing that would that would truly haunt her. Welcome to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies. Each episode, a brilliant screenwriter revisits their initial screenplay for what became a beloved movie, discussing what changed, what didn't, and why, from first draft to the big screen. Today on the show, a deep dive into Marvel's latest superhero adventure, Black Widow, with the excellent Eric Pearson. Eric is the screenwriter responsible for giving Natasha Romanoff the Avengers super spy with a dark past, the solo movie she's always deserved. Eric's account of writing the film makes for a fascinating glimpse inside the Marvel machine, how their movies are written, the relentless pace at which that machine moves, and how each film is made to fit into a much bigger interconnected story at script level. I'll warn you now though, you may well feel stressed out just hearing about the challenges in front of Eric when he came on board the project. Eric had inherited an outline mapped out by Ned Benson and WandaVision showrunner Jack Schaefer. Within that outline were a bunch of puzzle pieces and not much time to make them all fit together. Production was looming and sets for the film were already being constructed. In this episode, Eric shares how he navigated the intense pressure of having to write such a highly anticipated movie in such a short amount of time. We also talk about what guided him towards the theme of family at the heart of this movie and all the different story avenues explored during the screenplay's creation, including the truth behind rumours of a planned cameo from Tony Stark. This is a spoiler-filled conversation, as you've no doubt already guessed, so if you're yet to see Black Widow, please do hit pause now, get yourself to a cinema or watch the film on Disney+, Plus, then come back as we dive into every single one of this film's many twists and turns. Before we do that though, can we please take a second to discuss how Script Apart is now also a magazine? Yes, we recently launched a Patreon page and we wanted to do something special to market. This 51 page digital magazine is full of exclusive interviews with the writers of movies like Palm Springs and Blue Valentine, as well as written versions of classic Script Apart interviews with the likes of Aaron Sorkin and Barry Jenkins. To get your copy, as well as many other perks, head to patreon.com forward slash script apart or click the link in today's show notes. Okay, with that out of the way, let's get into my conversation with Eric Pearson about the brilliant Black Widow. A massive thank you to our Patreon supporters, that includes Lewis Adamu, Jonathan Wakem, and Kim Helbum. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demack. Eric, so great to have you with us. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's fantastic to have you here. Um, huge congrats on Black Widow, first and foremost, Eric. It, it's not only one of my favourite Marvel movies to date, but it's also quite possibly the Marvel movie that I think as a screenwriter I'm most fascinated by, just in terms of the storytelling challenges that it must have posed. Like that small window in this much wider narrative that you were handed to fill, the implications that meant for the story you could tell, the tonal tightrope that you had to walk because of who this character is and, and what her past represents. You're going to give me dramatic flashbacks here. <laughs> well, if you yes. think about them all at once, they, it is it is insane. And there's a point at the very beginning where I was thinking about them all at once. It was everyone knows that Natasha's dead. OK, that's tough. Uh, everything happens between Captain America Civil War and Captain and, and Avengers Infinity War. OK, that's tough. Uh, like it was just, yeah, there was a lot of things where it was like, if you thought about them all at once, it was, it was very, very daunting. Yeah. Cause to put it in perspective for any listeners who don't know the story of the beginning of your involvement in Black Widow is this and jump in if I get any of these details wrong. You'd been at Marvel for a while coming up through the writer's program there. You were given a number of puzzle pieces, some characters that Marvel wanted to use, some locations and a general narrative direction. Natasha getting the band back together, so to speak, with her former family. Pre-production was already underway. Sets were already being built. The Gulag, for example. This all sounds to me like being handed a $200 million Rubik's Cube or, or a jigsaw puzzle and being told to solve it now, the clock is ticking. Did it feel that way when you were handed the opportunity? 
The jigsaw puzzle is a better analogy. Yeah, it's more like we hear some pieces, but we don't know what the puzzle looks like. So build a build a puzzle and then put it together somehow. And you have, but you have to use all these parts. So yeah, no, that's very well researched, and I think that you're 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 right on. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of how it happened. That's kind of how it happened. <laughs> so how did you ride out that pressure? You know, it sounds like at the beginning anyone would feel daunted by that list that we've just described of challenges that this project posed. How did you turn that into Black Widow? How did you overcome the challenge? I don't know. (laughs) Honestly, I mean, that's not the, I think I've just kind of, I had some training through Marvel before when Ant-Man was shifting directors from Edgar Wright to Peyton Reed. I I was in there for about six weeks uh, and that was a similar sort of pressure of, of getting that movie ready to go. And although the time crunch wasn't quite the same, but Thor Ragnarok was very kind of similar. And I guess I just kind of had had the training. So I didn't, I didn't immediately lose my shit. <laughs> and I just kind of, I, I came in and knew it's also there, there, there's sometimes, I think I'm a bit of a fear motivated person as well. And I knew that there was this big thing and people were kind of depending on me. And I also had a bit of a, a, a Zen idea of like, there's only so many hours in the day. And I don't mind working all of those hours when it's it's for something good. So when it came in, when I, I I came on, the first like week or two was probably just absorbing information, reading all reading the previous drafts and talking with Kevin Feige and Brian Jepek, our, our producer, and Scarlett, who's an executive producer, and Kate, who's uh, the director, and getting everybody's thoughts and trying to just have all the information and then. For me, for a big movie, you need you need a you need a treatment or or at least a kind of beat sheet. You need some sort of blueprint. So then I was working with them for a few weeks of just being like, we need to just just set up point A through Z. I need I need that for me to be able to say A happens, then B happens, then C happens. Even if we change it, I need for the first draft, we need to do that. So we did that. And then it was pretty much just working for you know, like all day, sometimes till like two or three in the morning. I was, I, I was flying back at that point and I was at Disney in the Frank G. Wells building. And, you know, there were some times when I would be, you know, leaving at two or three in the morning, but like, I don't know. It's also like, you get to tell stories for a living. You can't complain too much. And <laughs> fortunately also with this, especially with Natasha as a character, it wasn't as hard to find her voice and character. There was, there were, examples there there were there were examples that i had been very familiar with having worked with marvel before having seen these movies having no you know knowing these movies so i kind of knew it, it's easier to it's easier to build something when you have a constant when you know you have natasha romanoff and this you have a voice and you kind of know the difference from talking to kevin and scarlet and kate of like this is the different way we're taking natasha uh i, I wasn't just the the worst thing that you can have really or at least in my opinion the worst thing is uh, blank slate. You can do whatever you want because if every, you know, I like having a little bit with, with these things, having a little bit of, of an understanding of where I can start building off of, you know, the building blocks. That makes sense. Yeah. I, I suppose as well as those practical challenges, there's an emotional pressure. There's a cultural pressure that's being applied as well with a film like this. I mean, Marvel means so much to so many. These are characters that have existed for years in cinematic form and decades in comic form. What was your process of of tuning out the noise so you could follow your own instinct about what kind of story you needed to tell here? I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I do that either. I just kind of, because I do care, really care what people think, but sometimes when it comes to work, you just, something in my brain knows that like that won't help me at all. And and also I think coming at it from the perspective of, oh, I have to write a great female uh, superhero. It's, it's not like, no, I have to write Natasha. Like Natasha Romanoff has things established. We know a bit who she is. I'm also talking to Scarlett, who has played her for seven, eight movies at this point. She's got very strong opinions. She's really helping me understand who this is. Tuning it out is difficult, I guess there, there's kind of relief in, in the futility of it because you're never going to fully under, you're never going to fully appreciate or not appreciate. You're never going to fully satisfy everybody. I remember there was, I, I don't do too much social media, but I remember uh, checking a, a 
some men- mention on Twitter around when Thor Ragnar came out where someone was very angry that Hela had become Thor's half sister. And they, they demanded purity. And I was like, well, I'm pretty sure in the comics, Hela is Loki's daughter by some sort of unholy union with a wolf. And I was like, you really <laughs> want that? Is that the thing that you're going to die on your hill for? Uh, and apparently for this person, it was. And, and you know, uh, good for them. But like, I couldn't do that. I can't, you can't give... Tom Hiddleston and a wolf giving birth to this character who, you know, is older than him and Hemsworth. And it's the villain. Does it make sense? So you kind of just, you need to just think about what you're trying to do every day with us. We were trying to tell the Natasha Romanoff story, the kind of fill in this blank from her past and from her, you know, emotional journey of, of, you know, what's the difference between the past and the present. And also what made her kind of open up emotionally and make that ultimate sacrifice in Avengers Endgame, where she gave her life for the whole universe. Mm. Yeah. I mean, as it happens, of course, the response to the film has been pretty rapturous. What do you think it is about this movie on a story level? Obviously the performances are incredible, the way that the action is brought to life, all so impressive, but what do you think it is on a story level that so many people have connected to? I got to assume it's the family simply because that's my favorite part. The, The family together, and the family dinner scene, especially. And uh, I remember having those conversations about like, this is what's the great about Marvel. The things you can only do in Marvel is that we're having that kind of traditional Thanksgiving dinners gone wrong argument scene with the family, but they're all in these like weird spandex superhero suits and they've, you know, just fallen out of the sky and there's a mind controlled pig. Like there's just, you get to do the, <laughs> the a very familiar kind of setting and then add this, this kind of comic book craziness to it, which for me made it so fun. But I think the reason that people get attached to these, these uh, characters is more, they, they see a little bit of themselves in it. And, you know, so I think people especially responded to Natasha and Yelena and kind of the, the the bickering sisters the the little sister constantly needling the older sister uh which all came from a place of you know wanting to belong and that's what i think florence did incredibly well is not only was she funny and delivering those lines and needling her and being very charming like she was able to to kind of set the, the underlying pain of you left me like we were we were best friends we were sisters you, you left me to go do this other thing how come how could you not bring me with you like that was that that's what really kind of made it. And I think hopefully that's what makes people kind of tear up at the end when she says, uh, you know, it was real to me too. And they have that kind of moment on the the ground below the crash. So I, yeah, I would have to say it's the family. There's so much in the film, atonement, family, the ways in which we can and can't outrun our past. These are all themes that kind of have a presence in the film. Did you take a breather amidst the kind of like madness of, oh God, I've got to, this is the task in front of me. Did you take a moment to kind of sketch those things out so you knew where you were heading? No, I would be lying if I said that I had all that figured out going into the first draft. I, I think that my, in my mind, they were the characters were much more, uh, for the first draft at least, they were much more uh, archetypes. There was, you know, uh, bratty little sister and oafish dad. And, you know, it, it was more like that. I was at that point... I had gotten very swept up at the beginning of the, of the logic of the, of the villain plot of the plot. Like, cause we also in, in having this time period between civil war and infinity war, we had to create a villain who was from Natasha's past that she also didn't go after. So she had to believe that he was already taken care of. How does that work? And he has to be threatening the world in a way that if it succeeds, could go unnoticed because we've seen movies since then. If he says, I'm going to blow up the moon, we know that that didn't happen. (laughs) We know he's going to lose because the moon remains in all the movies that have come after civil war. Uh, I was, so for the first draft, I was very much, I need to, let's try and get the action moving in the right direction. Let's have everything make sense from A to B to C to D all the way through to Z that we can understand it. And kind of put the uh, uh, just kind of uh, more of a, a skeleton of the the characters there, and then we can start fleshing them out a little bit more. Which I, you know, which we got to do in subsequent drafts, and which really, honestly, more than any other project, I feel like got 
uh, so much help from the actual actors themselves and, and getting to do about a week of rehearsal a few weeks before we started shooting, which was, you know, I feel like by the time we got it to them, it was good. Like the character stuff was, was totally serviceable and, and at times very good, but I feel like working with them together made it much better and great. I read that you wrote that first draft in just 11 days. As a small aside, I think you've just overtaken Barry Jenkins on the script apart guest leaderboard for quickest screenplay written. He, he, he did Moonlight. What was his? What was his? He did Moonlight. And I think he said 14 days, which is pretty nuts. Um, oh, come on. I know. Yeah. Really? I'm sorry. No, I, that, that's, 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 wow. That's very, very, very <laughs> impressive. And he was doing it for himself to direct too, which is yeah, crazy. Exactly. Yeah. But in terms of your first draft that you got out after 11 days, what were the major differences? I mean, you've mentioned there that the characters were sort of sketches of the characters they'd become and that you really dialed up, you know, the relationships between them, the dialogue between them. Yeah. What else kind of changed is from that first draft onwards? Well, the first draft didn't have American Pie in it. I remember that. That was because that came up from the 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 chaos of the those rehearsals. And I think uh, Kate, our director, did something really smart in in kind of letting the four of them loose on me. Where they sat, she sat me down. She was like, "We're going to go to these rehearsals and talk about." We all knew the family dinner scene was going to be the big one. It's it's just enormous. It's eight or nine pages. It's comedy. It's it's kind of emotional climaxes it's it's a pig <laughs> being mind controlled <laughs> with a bunch of comic book exposition so sitting at that table where she sat down and also it's just there's no way for it not to be intimidating when it's Scarlett Johansson Florence Pugh Rachel Weisz David Harbour they all come in with all their own ideas of what they want to do they're all saying it at once and it, at first I was like having a full on panic attack but when I was able to get away and kind of like take down their ideas I figured out different ways to do it. And and that all came from David saying, I should get up and put on music and we should all be dancing. And I was like, Oh my God, this scene's getting out of control. But from that, the cast at some point started singing American pie and like all, each of them knew different parts of it. So they would kind of join in and it was just <laughs> surreal. And, and from that talking with David and Florence, that kind of became a, Oh, what if that's little Yelena's, favorite song as a kid and that can come back which was great so that was a really a fun thing to find and something that wasn't in the first draft the significance of that song as well particularly american pie there are these undertones in those opening scenes of yes they're undercover but they've fallen in love with or certainly natasha yelena they've fallen in love with american culture to an extent yeah well the key and that was another key thing that was to be that was discussed a lot is that yelena doesn't know like, and I was very, I had to be very kind of like, you know, certain of that because whether or not she was too young when she was taken for them to tell her, or she was so young that they told her and she just forgot and assumed it was her real life. Like she needed to not know what the hell was going on. She was more traumatized and which leads to, you know, another great moment of it was real for me. And like, you know, how, how she's the one, I, all of them have had pretty you know, bad runs in their life. Mm. But Yelena, for, uh, for some reason, maybe because she's the youngest or because she was the most innocent, really had the biggest impact emotionally, I feel like, to the audience of, I got completely blindsided by this. <laughs> like, you you guys got a chance to tense your body before the car crashed. I was just out the window flying across the highway. Anyway, but that's off your, your question. I'm trying to think of other differences between first and... Well, in the first draft, we didn't reveal that the red room was in the sky until Natasha dove out of the window, which was a, a, a callback to a, a very kind of famous comic panel from one of her, uh, the great black widow comics. It just ended up being too much Marcus and McFeely who did, who are great role models of mine. I've gotten to work with them on an infinity war and end game. I think they're great. They have a phrase that I love, which is that's a long way to go for salami, which is <laughs> when you're writing, so much extra stuff, like extra mediocre stuff, trying to explain one thing. It's just a long way to go for something that's just okay. <laughs> and I, while it was a cool reveal, we had to basically no characters could talk about knowing where they were. They couldn't say up here. They could, it had to change their language so much. So we, we ultimately were like, we're going to, people are going to know, we're going to have to just tell them right away. Mm. That that's that. And it also kind of gets a question out of people's mind 
of how did this evil organization remain, uh, you know, above the radar for so many years while Natasha was off there kind of traveling the globe, saving, you know, saving people. And in terms of like establishing when this film is happening, it can be confusing for people who aren't like, you know, uh, Marvel heads. Was there anything else you explored to try and communicate quickly that this is happening here? This is the situation in case you haven't seen Civil War recently. How did you kind of approach that? I always kind of take a heavy hand to it and then it gets cut, it gets cut down. I, William Hurt had more lines in his scene uh, going to kind of apprehend her. He had a longer speech about exactly kind of what had happened. Right now, it's been kind of reduced to uh, uh, she assaulted the king of Wakanda and and she's in, in, in violation of the Sokovia Accords. It's it's we hit a few things to say the, you know, to imply when it happened and then the radio as well. I think that, I think I did a lot more and ultimately we kind of just trusted the audience to, to kind of pick up where, where we were in the timeline. Mm. Did I hear as well that it was during these kind of early opening establishing scenes, there was a Tony Stark kind of blinking, you'll miss it, bit of archive footage that helped also kind of set the scene. There was one one of the previous versions of the script had, and I wouldn't, I couldn't even really call it a new scene. It was just, it was the, it would have been the exact moment from Avengers Compound where she says, "I'm from Civil War," so not even new photography, just her saying that the final couplet between her and Tony. I forget what he says to her, but she says, "I'm not the one who has to walk watch my back," and then she leaves because that's the last time we see her in Civil War. That was written into another version uh, of the script as just like a cue. Uh, uh, to to say here's exactly where we are, but it was never we kind of jettisoned that when I started when I started in on it. Mm. So it wasn't really. It was funny too because I remember I was in London working on it, and the news broke of Robert Downey Jr. doing a cameo, and I remember looking around and being like, "Am I missing something?" Like because I'm here <laughs> doing this, and I had to go around. I was like, "Is is Downey like? We, am I supposed to be doing something for Robert?" And they're like, "No." <laughs> no, no, this is not, and, I, and I don't, I don't know how it, how that big story got out. But the only thing I can remember is like one much older version of the script had that as like a, yeah, like a, basically like a timing cue. Here we are at the end of Civil War. Now let's start the movie. Yeah, I think it is so much more powerful this film for the fact that it isn't crowded out by other Avengers. There are no cameos. It's Natasha's solo movie. We've waited a while to get it, so it should be about her, her family, her journey. But we should dive into some into some scenes from the script, Eric. It, it begins with such a bang. The script begins in 1995 with this flashback to a scene of domestic family normality, or so it seems. Um, what did you want to achieve in this opening sequence that, of course, culminates in that thrilling airfield escape? And and crucially, what was the significance to you of the bioluminescent forest that begins the film and we'll come back to later in the very final scene? Taking the second part first, I think that was more just, you know, that was a happy time in her life where she had forgotten what was imposed upon her, what was supposed to be expected from her. As she said later, you took my childhood and my choices. Like, you know, that was a point where she was got to just be a kid and felt free and and not like a product of the Red Room who is going to be forced to do rough things for the rest of her life or for, you know, seemingly at that point. So then we wanted to kind of just bring it back as like a, a you know, she found peace and and she found like tranquility in her heart and is is happy at the end of this as she goes off to the adventures that will, you know, lead through Infinity War and Endgame. Uh, as far as what we wanted to like achieve, I guess a lot of things like it, it was fun. It's also tricky taking a character like Natasha Romanoff, who we've seen now for seven or eight movies and the audience is going to be like, Oh, I know her. I know what to expect from her. Uh, they're, they're going to go in with expectations no matter what. And we kind of wanted to take these have moments right from the beginning that are like, Oh, I didn't, I didn't know that about her. So to start in the nineties and to say, wow, Natasha actually had been Amer in, been to America before she defected and, and joined shield I was like, oh, okay, that's something I didn't know. And she did this, had this this family. And at first you're kind of like, is this her actual family? Or is this, oh no, it's kind of like the Americans. Like, oh, I didn't know, I didn't know that about her. It, we wanted, we wanted to have the audience kind of be shaken loose of of what they were justifiably, you know, probably going to expect. 
it was a, it was also a very good cho- or a, a very good. I, I thought it was good, but it was very, uh, you know, it was a choice to have that scene where she walks into the trailer and finds Mason O.T. Fag Benley's yeah, character, yeah. where he's asleep in the bed. And I really kind of wanted that to be for the audience to be like, like, hang on. Like, I know her and I know all her friends. I've seen her in eight movies. Who the fuck is this guy? Like, why is she so comfortable with him? Why have I never heard about him before? What is going on? What is their relationship? And because we really wanted to, to get the audience back to square one of like, you don't really know everything about her. And she has lived a lot of lives before this movie. You know, that that opening was meant to kind of put the audience hopefully off balance and and be like, okay, well, no, I can't expect uh, an Avengers movie or, uh, you know, a Captain America movie or an Iron Man movie, all of which she's been a great part of before. When it's her in the driver's seat, things are different than you expect. The quiet brutality of that scene when they land, they escape America, they land in, in Cuba, I think it is. So, yeah. 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 Um, you know, leading into the film's credits, you know, those scenes kind of really hint at real world sex trafficking or certainly that's been a lot of fans and critics interpretation of the black widow program that they're thrown into against their will can you tell me about the degree to which that was something you were referencing and and how you threaded that needle natasha is a character with an incredibly dark past on paper whose story has echoes of real life injustice that persists in our world today that was something i mean i i always would prefer to go darker and, and gnarlier, but that was something I really wanted to take cues from Kate Shortland, our director and Scarlett, you know, our executive producer. I was like, I feel like you guys would be a better litmus test for how far we're going to take this and how far it becomes exploitative or too scary or too dramatic or traumatic. Or I, I felt like it, and it was a constant conversation. That was a, a, a very big, uh, we wanted to find the right balance where it, it had impact, but didn't seem gruesome or over the top. The, the part that I found myself way more invested in, uh, or at least I felt I, ha- I had a, a bigger stake in the argument was what you were saying, if she has a dark past and she's talked about red on her ledger and you don't know all the things that we that I've done. For me, the thing that mattered that I wanted, that I argued a lot for on the story side is that when we see some of uh, something that she does did from her past that she regrets, it can't just be like, Oh, I was doing something and people got hurt by accident. Mm. The Drake daughter thing of, I, I wanted out. Uh, I saw a way out and the way out was to intentionally harm a, a little girl who is, ba- it's basically what Natasha most wants to protect. You see it with Yelena uh, young Yelena, where she says, don't touch her. It's, it's, she wants to protect herself, uh, other young girls like herself and Yelena. She hasn't been able to, and then to get away from this guy and to stop it, she has to, to hurt an innocent young girl. I wanted her dark past to be really gnarly. I wanted her to have made a decision that keeps her up at night because if, if it's, you know, she's so cool, she's been so cool. And part of what is so cool about Natasha is, the mystery, the dark mystery in Scarlett's performance and all these other movies of like, you don't know what I've done in the past. And like, in your mind, you're like, Oh, it must be really fucked up what you've done in your past. So because we now know that she's giving up her life in Endgame, if we didn't know that, then I never would have unpacked any of these mysteries. It's, it's the fact that this is the end of Natasha's story. It made it feel all right to go in there and show some of these things that have happened to her past, from her past that affected her and affected who she was as a person and, and what she had regret about and what kept her up at night. Uh, and I wanted that to be actually pretty bad and a thing that would, that would truly haunt her. Mm. And on that same note, there's there's a fantastic scene immediately after the Gulag rescue, not to jump too far ahead, where Alexei makes a joke about it being Yelena's time of the month. And she yeah, responds, yeah. I don't get my period dipshit. I don't have a uterus. That's what happens when the Red Room gives you an involuntary hysterectomy. They just kind of go in and rip out all your reproductive organs. Yeah. Alexei is very uncomfortable. He says, OK, OK, stop. And the biggest laugh in the entire film was at Florence's, when I watched it in the cinema the other day, was Florence's delivery of okay? I was about to start talking uh, talking about fallopian tubes. Oh, that makes me so happy. That makes because <laughs> I, I, I that was a big that was like a rocky road for me. Because but I I was the sole pusher for fallopian tubes. I want to say fallopian <laughs> tubes. 
<laughs> I think I, I made the mistake of, of not because I, and I will tell you too, from uh, we had a premiere event here. And when he said, what is it? Your time of the month, the surround stereo groans that I heard the angry response, I just ducked in my chair. I was like, Oh no, we're never going to be able to get back from this. Like people were so angry. And I thought back to, Thank God for for where we went in Florence being able to get us out. But when I uh, I wrote that, it was it was for me it was okay. Alexi is a misogynistic and outdated character. Like that is that is his personality. He's been in prison for twenty three years now. He's he's a he's a bit of a sexist oaf. I was like, this is a good way to introduce him. And I and the, the joke was supposed to be that he is so out of touch and, and such a dipshit that he would actually say that. And when I put it in there, everyone had problems. I was like, okay, well, I guess we need to like, he, he, it, cause if he just says it, then he wins the moment. And I forget who said like, well, you know, you don't get your period when you don't have a uterus. Uh, and the, and then I was like, oh, well then like what men like him get very uncomfortable with is any sort of, uh, you know, uh, specificity of, of quote unquote lady issues. And it would seem like Florence was the perfect one She's the, her character is the most mad at him. She's the kind of most emo- emotionally volcanic of the characters for her to just go in and, you know, like we gave her kind of the outline of it. And she, she did a couple of improvs too, that I thought were even funnier, but yeah, for that, that was, that was really the key to, to make sure that she won the moment. Cause, cause it wasn't enough to, and that's where I was wrong. And I'm glad they corrected me that it, it wasn't funny just to have him be a, an, an out of touch dick. The the girls needed to win the moment of that and be like, it's your fucking time's up for you. Like you, you don't get to say that kind of things anymore because you're ruining the world. And this is a specific way that people like you and your thinking has ruined the world mm. and my world specifically. But I think that moment speaks to one of the challenges of writing a film like this. How do you find humor in a story that's embedded in trauma because of the past that these characters yeah. have escaped. How hard was that tonal balance? I always try and make things funny whenever I can, which which I just think it's a good way to endear endear people to the audience. And also to have like sometimes it's it's normally it's rarely jokes that work to make people laugh. It's character dynamics. And so what we have with Natasha Romanoff is like the most intentionally closed off of the Avengers. Like she started her life over again, left her past behind in her mind. It, I've always thought she just pretended it never happened. Like this is, I, I, I've done that it's over. And then she got to present herself to the Avengers and her new life and her new family, however she wanted to be seen. What's a fun character to put that person with is a kind of younger version of you who is equally as dangerous from the fight that we see, but like where, you know, Natasha is completely closed off. Yelena is, like I said, she's like emotionally volcanic. She just kind of got out of there and she's not scared to say, this is what I think of that. This is what I feel about this. And to have them going against each other, that's funny to me. That, that like, just th- their conversation gets funny. To have Ofish kind of father who is so single or kind of single-minded that he can't even see uh, he's just constantly thinking about how great he's doing. Uh, and he is truly proud that they've killed so many people because that was the job that he was given. And he didn't think as to why he was given that job. That to me is funny. And then also sometimes you just kind of score free ones where I, I always thought it was funny, but I never thought it would be as funny as I, it makes me laugh every time with, you know, there's a lot of these movies these days where after a big fight or whatever, is everyone okay? And we're like, yeah, everyone looks like they've been beat to shit. And, and they're like, yeah, no, we're good. We're good. But just to have Rachel, who is, who is very, who is the, you know, she dealt with her trauma by, by going science and logic and like, I'm going to compartmentalize everything in my brain. So I don't have to deal with this side of things. She's just so blunt and straightforward. Just, I am clearly injured. I don't know why that makes me laugh a lot. And Rachel's delivery has gotten a laugh every time I've seen it. Sometimes you just stumble on them and they, and they, that, that was a big one for me too, because that's towards the end of the movie. And when people laughed, I I was like, Oh, thank God. They're still paying attention. Mm -hmm. Like we've got, we've got them. If they're still laughing at that. How did you land on the mind control agent as the, the MacGuffin of the movie? I honestly don't remember. (laughs) 
I don't remember. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm trying to think. Oh, it was it was kind of a puzzle piece thing. It was it was. Uh, yeah, it was a puzzle piece thing because we knew we needed to get to Budapest. We knew we had to shine light on what had happened in Budapest as fans have been wondering what to, has happened in Budapest. And it felt like a good place for Yelena to 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 be. But um, I don't know. We needed we needed a, re- a reason. And I think that I it's hard to remember these because like when you're when you're working these these emergency kind of sessions they they go for 12, 14, 16 hours. And it's a lot of just being in a windowless room, pitching things. And I remember pitching this kind of uh, this moment. Oh, that was something that was something that was different in the first draft. I think in the first draft, one of the packages that came from the Budapest safe house, she opens it and she gets gassed. Yelena is that, or and is she that? Doesn't, uh, yeah, Natasha got right. gassed. Uh, and I didn't even totally know where it went, but I was like, oh, okay. And then from there, we came up, we, we realized the idea that after Natasha was able to break away from the Red Room, Drake Off had started instituting a much more total chemical level of, of mind control on his agents because uh, of Natasha's successful defection. Um, and then we realized, okay, well, then it doesn't make sense that she would get that like, so, you know, but that, that was a different thing. And, but then, yeah, we kind of worked backwards from that and it became a really cool also idea or a way to see a fully activated Yelena Belova in Morocco, which is one of my favorite things just because of how brutal and, and gnarly Florence is with the knife twist and the pull and her just like, she has that look in her eyes that that's a bit uh doing chores that's really scary and then to see the change when she gets gas and kind of regains full control of her faculties uh i don't know it was a very good visual storytelling uh of of what needed to be stopped what uh you know what our villain plot kind of could be all about of a cowardly man hiding in the sky who's just manipulating things from afar because he's too scared to actually deal with people and speaking of Yelena, I'm really curious to know, Marvel as a studio, they've innovated this interconnected storytelling style that spreads out character arcs over multiple movies and TV shows. When you're given a character like Yelena, are you instructed, okay, this character is going to be in the Hawkeye show maybe, or they're going to have their own solo movie perhaps, and this is going to happen down the line. Please, can you plant these seeds or is it kind of free reign for you? It was, it was free reign. It, it was, well, cause even just from being a fan and from having worked at Marvel before, before knowing uh, literally anything about the Black Widow movie, I was, I was very confident that Yelena Belova was going to be in this movie. So, uh, and I'd read some of the comics from before. So I, but in the comics, she's very different. She's very much like a blonde doppelganger, a little bit more evil version of Natasha. Uh, no, it was really, we were really, given free reign to kind of find her own version of this character. The one mandate was the, uh, was the post-credit scene, which was uh, that, that was the thing. And I loved the idea. Uh, there was talk of, of, of Julie Dreyfus at that point, big secret being cast as Valentina. So I was so excited. Uh, but then they said, all right, we're going to end it with her sending her uh, Yelena to kill Hawkeye. And I said, why? And they're like, don't worry, don't worry about it. And I was like, no, but I need to know why. And that, that was, that made, that hurt my heart because I felt like they had an idea and I couldn't tell if I was, I really couldn't tell if I was going to be screwing over somebody else in the future of like giving them this problem they got to figure out. But, you know, uh, that's where sometimes you just got to, you know, it's their, it's their, it's their universe. They're, they are Marvel's characters. You got to trust them to say, all right, if you say this is what's happening next, then that's what's happening next. The scene in which they're reunited is so thrilling. I'm, I'm curious to know, Eric, when you write a Marvel movie, are you beholden to the fact that, you know, you've got to get action beats in every X amount of pages, you know, let's find a, a space for them to fight? Or do you lead from character? These two people haven't seen each other for so many years when they meet and they have that fight in the apartment. And they can't know for a fact that they can trust each other. It, and I think it speaks to their loneliness as escaped Black Widows, that even someone you once considered your sister is no match for your guardedness and your paranoia at the person they might now be. 
therefore a fight yeah. ensues. Can you talk to me about your process when it comes to action sequences? So you're one? making me remember some other things too. I believe part of the reason why at first we had uh, Natasha open the case in Norway and get Gans was we wanted her extra on edge of like, what did you do to me? Like, I'm fighting you because like, it looks like you poisoned me. But in my mind, it, it always made sense that if they haven't seen each other in years uh, and now like they've, they've, she's made contact and they, they just don't trust each other. And they, and there is also kind of that, you know, there's a bit of the sibling thing of like, no, I, I, I get dessert first or just whatever the conflict is, is like, if the, if we're in conflict and if there's, you know, if, if tensions have been raised between us, they're going to fight. Now there was, yeah, there, there was a moment. It was kind of, it wasn't like a mandate. It was, it was more like we all kind of understood, like we want, you know, we're not going to get to see Nat again. We want to see Natasha and Yelena Belova fight. We want to, we want to see it at least once on the big screen. Um, and I love that fight. And for me, what worked out great for it was the kind of the the ending, like the ending for them to go to a stalemate. And uh, as, as you know, they're both choking each other unconscious. And I wrote it as like, you don't know who's going to go out first, but like if, if one of them really wanted to kill the other, then whoever is going out first is going to die. Um, to have them call the truce to be looking in each other's eyes. And I think, and, and Natasha calls it first I, that that was more important on a story level, and it's always better when you can tell you can have good story beats with, you know, with your action, with your your you know your big set pieces. How about Melina? We haven't discussed Melina. One thing that struck me about her character is she initially betrays Natasha, only to regret it and atone for her actions. Often in 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 cinema and storytellings. Atonement comes with sacrifice. That person will save our hero's life at the expense of their own as the ultimate show of how they've been one round to our hero's worldview. I, I wondered whether there was ever a moment where you considered killing Melina in the film's climax. No, there was not. Weirdly, I think there might have been a version before I got there where Alexi died. I, I, wait, don't quote me on that. I don't know. <laughs> But no, Melina, I don't remember ever recalling. Uh, Melina was a tricky one to, to get because she gets the, you know, um, she gets the least amount of screen time because she's the last one that they that they reunite with. Uh, my first piece of advice would be hire someone like Rachel Vice to add <laughs> a great amount of, 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 yeah, of, of, of death and emotion and all that. But it was uh, through those scenes also we kind of naturally toward went towards it was a family as a whole but like for the individual redemption moments it was little sister and dad and big sister and mom uh and the the idea of the the idea of the uh album was really helpful which was just a, i think that might have actually been a kate idea of like that it was all these pictures that were all taken in the same day uh as part of staging you know i, lo I love all those little things even like when alexi says you're as beautiful as the day that we, uh, we, they staged our marriage. Um, but I think once we really got to the point that it was, it, it was Natasha being so impressive to her mother figure that she managed to fight her way out that Yelena, that, that Melina was so smart and capable that she managed to survive through the red room and rise through the ranks to get to a place of importance where she could be allowed to do research elsewhere, that she could have uh, uh, an elder statesman kind of status there and that she survived all the brutal missions that she had to do and that she made herself out like that was how she survived. That's the why does the the mouse in the cage run on that little wheel like it's all she's known. She found the best way to do her own life. And then she's getting to see this, this little girl that was part of that life, part of her life of obeying and watching out for number one. And her surrogate daughter basically has done more and, and it's, it ha has tried to do better with her life that that is so impressive. And for the emotion, hopefully of Scarlett saying, uh, or Natasha saying that's, you know, you, it's some, it's part of what you did raising me, helped me become this better person. We, it was, it was, that was the moment of, you know, where Rachel Weiss again helps you by, by being able to deliver 
uh, I, oh my God, I've made a terrible mistake. How can I make this right? For the record, if you had killed Alexi, we'd be having a very different conversation right now, Eric. I'll just be yeah. screaming, how I could you? Why did you do that to me? Um, can, can you talk <laughs> to me about the, uh, the film's exciting climax? It, it's such a good blend of Natasha's personal story coming to, coming to a climax and also spectacle. How did you uh, configure this whole sequence that um, is almost Bond-esque in its kind of outrageousness? There is there is a great deal of kind of Bond vibe in it. Um, well, we, they had they had shown me also when I came in, there was art and there was comics that we really, you know, we have this idea for the Red Room is the floating fortress. And there was, a again, that famous kind of comics run where she busts out of a building and falls. So, like, they kind of had that idea uh how i i don't know honestly that was the hardest part besides the family the family dinner was the most intimidating because i felt like the writing was most on display for me and i wanted to get it right and i knew that if it wasn't good then the whole movie would fall apart so that but we with the rehearsals and and we kind of locked that in early and i was feeling really good about it and we got to to shoot that early so it felt like it was off my plate the most difficult thing was certainly the ending because it, it was just too many, there's too many pieces to keep track of. You've got two heroes in one place, two heroes in another place, or one hero in another place. And then also two of them are each other and two of them don't have ear. It was just, it was, it was really difficult <laughs> is what I remember. Just keeping track of the information and who was able to know what, at what time there was more than one occasion where I would script something and then be like, Nope, no, like, Elena doesn't know that at this point. She doesn't even know her objective. I've got to go back and and get her moving to get the gas, get the antidote gas to get to the like. Um, so again, it's one of those things where it, it, I would think I was just working on it so much and so often that I don't remember how I did it. It was just a constant uh, <laughs> state of of we want everyone to have big wins. We want to have those those fun moments and. We, we would ideally love for everybody to kind of get uh, a, you know, a, a fight win, a, a, a fun laugh moment. Uh, even like, I love Rachel just walking by like slight change of plans. Uh, I destroyed the engine. We're going into a crash. Like just like her <laughs> matter of factness always made me laugh from that. And I guess the thing that I wanted and, and uh, hopefully people like it, but there was something that I pushed for from the beginning that I remembered from a comic of her in the comic there. She's fighting a guy who has the pheromonal lock on her and she can't do anything. And she's just getting her ass kicked. And then he breaks her nose and there's a great panel of her looking up and she's got a psychotic smile and blood in her teeth. And she says, I can't smell you anymore. And then turns the tables. It's like a professional wrestling match. It's that <laughs> moment where Hulk Hogan hulks up and everyone's like going crazy. So I really, I wanted that so bad of her and we found the way for her to break her own nose, which felt even more kind of badass. That was, that was the thing I kept kind of pushing for. Uh, and it also, I felt like the pheromonal log, there was something so creepy about that. There's something like some of those scenes are pretty hard to watch just because of how creepy it is. And hopefully when Pete, when she smashes her nose against that desk, it, it is a, it is a jump up and cheer moment. Yeah. I'll, t I'll tell you what I love about that moment. Natasha started in this world, the MCU as a character sort of defined at first by how male characters perceived her and her beauty. And that act of like physical self disfigurement, if that's a word at the end, sure. it, it just felt like <laughs> such a great journey to go on from, from where she started it's it's i define my own limitations and also it's kind of her like you may think i'm a beauty but i'm a worker like i get the job done and and i just did a full you know double switch reverse interrogation on you and the only thing that went wrong is you weren't strong enough to break my nose so now i'm gonna have to break it on my own and beat the hell out of you and bring you to justice like I like I, I like that kind of that 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 attitude from Natasha Romanoff is, is something I like a lot. How would you describe the interior journey that Natasha has gone on by the end of this movie? It feels like she jets off to reunite the Avengers because of realization she has come to because of the experience she's just undergone. Patching up things with one family instills in her an urgency to repair her other family. Was that the intention? Yeah, I think it was kind of uh, it was a bit of like a. I wanted her to find also self-forgiveness and kind of 
peace with who she is and, and that she's not perfect because I think that that was a mistake that she made. She made a horrible uh, or a very difficult and, and uh, nasty decision to uh, at, at least at the moment, she thought kill a little girl to get her to, to dispose of her enemy and start a new life. And from that trauma, she basically shut off the whole previous part of her life. Now through the events of this movie, we get these, you know, that's, that's something I found really fun is that Natasha, you know, even there's a, there's a line in winter soldier where she turns to Steve Rogers and says, who do you want me to be? Like, it's like, Oh yeah, I, she gets to decide she can kind of be anyone except around these people, because there's something about your mom and your sister and your dad or whoever you grew up with. There's something about these people that will, that, that breaks down her like walls of like, she keeps trying to be about the plan and Yelena is asking her about the pose and she keeps trying to be about the plan. And Alexi's asking her about, uh, Captain America and all this stuff and why she's so mad at him. She keeps wanting it to be about the plan so it can be over because she's an Avenger. But uh, her, Melina's asking her, telling her not to slouch. By that point, she's just like literally like, here's what's going to happen until she really like accepts the fact that this meant something to her and addresses those emotions and that heartbreak and these people and forgives them and forgives herself for the things that she did. And, and that kind of gives you actual peace. And instead of just thinking, Oh, things went to the, things went to shit with the Avengers. Of course, just my luck. Uh, I should go off. She's like, no, I got to go back and I've got to try and help bring this family back together. That was, that was what we were hoping to accomplish with this. Well, it's such a fantastic send off to Natasha and such a fantastic film in its own right. It stands tall on its own. Oh, thank you. Eric, this has been a total blast. Thanks so much for coming on Script Apart. Awesome, man. No, I had a, a ton of fun. Hopefully I get to come back for another one sometime soon. <laughs> Let's do it. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.